on technology's role in modern healthcare. And moderating the panel will be Nina Ocherenko, who I've had the true delight and pleasure to work with in her 10 years, I see, at the Heritage Foundation. I was surprised in reading her bio. It's been 10 years since she's been there. And she's the Director of Health Policy Studies for the Heritage Foundation, where she deals with federal and state health policy issues, Medicare, Medicaid, prescription drugs, children's health sector, pretty much the whole run of the mill on um, taking a leadership role in health policy. Um, Nina has considerable experience on the Hill as well, and really brings that knowledge of how the Hill works, how decisions are made to really inform the policy debate. So welcome, Nina. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Grace Marie. Um, I just wanted to start, what a great and exciting event this is. For someone who kind of focuses on the day-to-day -day that's going on in Washington, it's a breath of fresh air to have some new ideas kind of coming to Washington to educate us on what's really going out in the healthcare sector and what innovation is bringing us in our daily lives. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to moderate this panel on technology's role in modern healthcare. Uh, as Grace Marie mentioned, I'm going to keep the bios also very short so we can hear the most from our speakers. And we're going to start with um, introducing our first speaker, Representative Todd Rokita from Indiana. Congressman Rokita is a member of the House Medical Technology Caucus and has been a leader in the House of Representatives on key issues including FDA reform, repealing the medical device tax, and reforming Medicaid. So with that very short introduction, we'll turn it over to the Congressman. Well, thank you, Nina. I appreciate that short introduction. I'm, I'm sure the audience does as well. Um, <clears throat> I have some remarks that are prepared and that I've, I've studied for this morning. And, uh, perhaps out of uh, more respect for uh, the amount of folks in this audience and who is in this audience, as well as my fellow panel mates, I'm not going to give these remarks. Uh, another reason I'm not going to do it is because the whip, uh, Kevin McCarthy, has summoned me to his office <laughs> at 1030, and I want to try to get to as many questions as I can. There could be any number of reasons, any number of votes that he summoned me uh, to, to his office, but I'm going to go there, which is also very interesting because I think he's on the panel after this. <laughs> so I'm not sure how that's going to work, but as a member of the WHIP team, I'm going to try to do what I'm told. Um, Indiana, you may not think about it, our, our great state this way, but um, and, and hopefully that's changing with uh, uh, the likes of, of, of brilliant leaders like Midge Daniels and um, some of the others of us who uh, worked in the executive branch of, of Indiana state government, uh, me being Secretary of State of Indiana for eight years, uh, we, we worked very hard to attract uh, the medical device industry uh, to Indiana. And a lot of it's been homegrown. Uh, Biomet, Zimmer, Cook, uh, of course, Eli Lilly. Uh, in the pharmaceutical realm, all, you know, all have their roots uh, in Indiana. And we're up to over 300 medical uh, device companies. Um, so that's kind of my background uh, coming into this as a new member of Congress. Uh, and in that, in that sense, I was very interested to work on the repeal of the Medical Device Act. Uh, part of, the, of Obamacare law, and, that, and, and that's because I clearly see that technology is going to be a critical and necessary part of our future if we are going to live within our means. And I also see that as a new member of the Budget Committee, where I see the drivers of our debt uh, being the social entitlement programs, and that the social entitlement programs really center around health care and therefore the costs, and of course the policies that are driving those costs. So technology is clearly going to be, uh, if we embrace it, uh, one of the solutions to what is this, the, the problem of our times, really. Um, and so the first thing we do there is to make sure that we don't tax something, because hopefully we all agree, and if we don't agree, I'm happy to have some debate around it, uh, we all agree that if you don't want something, if you don't like something, the first and best thing to do is to tax it. The Affordable Care Act assumes $20 billion in new revenues by this because of this 2.3% tax on medical devices. And I don't think that kind of money is ever going to be realized. Um, <clears throat> 
So we work really hard in talking with uh, Eric Cantor. Uh, I expect uh, leadership to schedule a vote on the repeal of the medical device tax sometime this summer. The bill, uh, H.R. 436, has 232 co-sponsors. I've been one of the freshman leads on it. Nearly every member, new member is on this bill uh, because of the things that I've just stated. Uh, so this is, these are one of the things that we have to do to protect the technology and innovation uh, that was talked about in the last panel, and that certainly includes uh, medical uh, devices. I also know that we have to embrace technology because I've seen it work in other areas of the government. Uh, what Nina didn't mention was that as Indiana Secretary of State, I turned in a budget uh, year over year that was no more than the budget that Indiana Secretary of State Evan Bay turned in in 1987, unadjusted for inflation. Now, can you imagine if this place, meaning Washington, D.C., worked on 1987 dollars? How much better off we'd be from a budget perspective? Now, <clears throat> now the only way, I wish I could say there was a magic wand I was able to wave or it was just sheer leadership, but none of that is true. Uh, we simply embraced and leveraged technology at every turn. Uh, putting all our transactions with heavily uh, the transaction laden technology or transaction intense office, all that's done online, mostly self-service, a statewide voter file. We had clerks in our state that were literally keeping voter registrations in shoe boxes. And we put all that online. You can register in, online in Indiana. Of course, having a photo ID, it's a lot easier to do things like that when you go to the polls. Um, but we were able to reduce the, blo the bloat on our rolls to over to the extent that it not only just affected my budget, but we were reducing county budgets because you were opening less polling places. All that uh, probably too long a way of saying that here in government and here with you all, we have got to do everything we can to embrace technology to drive down these costs. And none of these things and this is where it's scary when you have politicians involved, none of these things are gonna make the headlines until you really drive down the cost. But it's a lot of legwork, it's a lot of detail, it's a lot of minutia, and the only way we are gonna solve this country's debt problem is to embrace technology, and the Indiana Secretary of State's office was just a small example of that. But when your budget, again, when 66% of your federal outlays year over year are centered around healthcare, if we don't start uh, addressing those costs in terms of leveraging the technology, we're not going to get there. Um, really quickly, I want to address um, uh, the, the FDA. It seems like it could use not only some technology, but some policy direction. Um, one of the things that we ought to do with the FDA, I've heard from companies time and time again and, uh, that they get to the, um, if you think about it in terms of a baseball game, they get to the fifth, sixth, even eighth and ninth inning of the game only to have the bureaucrat say, hmm, I don't like that thing. Go ahead and start over. And now you're back at the first inning again. So uh, a bill that uh, I'm supporting that was just marked up in Energy and Commerce last night was part, made part of, a, of another bill, um, H.R. 3230, Keeping America Competitive Through Harmonization Act. That's Kathy uh, McMorris Rogers. Uh, that bill was put into another one last night, marked up, passed out of committee unanimously, and what it does is it introduces a little bit of competition and a whole lot of common sense to the FDA. And it says that if uh, a fellow tier one country uh, approves a medical device, uh, then uh, it's deemed approved here and vice versa, similar to how the aviation industry operates. If Boeing gets uh, something approved in Europe, the FAA deems it approved here. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, one guy. <laughs> now that's not for every, every application uh, in every area, but that kind of harmonization, I guess that's the industry term for it, is, another th is, is what's needed. And technology can help us get there, can help drive that to make sure that uh, the communication lines are open, that the data is flowing uh, correctly, and it's woefully uh, overdue. So with that, I'll stop. I'm happy to take questions as I can, and thank you very much for having me, Nina. Yes. Um,
because of the early dismissal that we'll have, uh, we will uh, take a few questions now before we continue with the rest of our panel. So if you have any questions for the congressman, um, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and then um, identify yourself. While we're doing that, if, if I may, I'd love to ask a question about where you see, um, do you see that there is opportunity in a bipartisan basis to really make this an issue moving forward? Uh, the, the FDA issue, the uh, technology and healthcare issue generally? In, is, in general, yeah. with, with healthcare technology. You know, it, it, it's a matter of ideology. I so often get um, asked, why can't you get anything done? Why can't you compromise? And in Indiana, you saw some, some stark results last night of compromise, of statesmanship, and what those two words mean, what they've meant in the past, or what they're going to mean in the future. And I simply say that, um, look, I, I'll bend over backwards to work with anybody. But we're at a point, I think, in this country, and we come to this point every once in a while. You might think it was uh, Reagan's time for choosing back in the 60s. Maybe we're at a different fork in a road, but a similar place. But we got to decide who we're going to be. Are we going to be more like Europe or even the South American countries, or are we going to be more like the last 200 years? And once the American people decide that, you're either going to have more Todd Rokitas or you're going to have more Nancy Pelosi's. But one way or the other, this country will move down the road. Now, I have a particular path I'd like to see it move down. Um, but we, it, it, everything else has been compromised away. And we are at two competing, oppositely opposed ideas. One that says the government at every turn makes a better decision than the individuals can, and one that says exactly the opposite thing. So there's nothing to compromise, Nina. Uh, we just have to decide, and you have to decide, you're all leaders. Look, you're here at 9.30 in the morning, earlier than that, 8.30, listening to a guy like me talk. <laughs> Besides any other addictions or afflictions you have, you're leaders. You have a sphere of influence at your dinner table, at your lunch break room table, um, at the fence post, at the church. And the old adage has been, Nina, never talk religion and politics. I think that's a stupid adage. Because if we're going to keep the republic as Franklin charged long ago, we need to be talking at least about politics. And I don't mean partisan politics. We are so far beyond that. I mean whether or not we're going to live under the plain meaning of the Constitution or not, politics. It used to be corny to talk about. But if you don't have a burning little pain in the pit of your stomach when you're having these conversations, like I do right now, then you're not out of your comfort zone. And we're going to lose this place as we know it. So once you decide, your Congress will follow suit. We'll have, and I think we could get something done one way or the other. Great. Uh, I think we have a question up front, if you can wait for the microphone. So as Grace Marie mentioned, this is being uh, webcast. Good morning. I'm David Lenihan, the chairman of Health Per, a uh, technology company. Thanks for your remarks. Uh, the, well, I'll add uh, DePew to your list of good companies. Thank you. And, uh, My apologies. I'm going to hear about that. <laughs> Um, but uh, the question involves a, a note from John Goodman, uh, who I don't think is here today, uh, and it has to do with the size of government and the power of bureaucrats, something you alluded to earlier in your comments. Uh, and it is an astounding number that the regulatory period of comment before the introduction of regulation has gone from 56 days in 2008 to 27 days in 2009 to five days hmm. in 2010. I didn't realize that. And I really think it's something that in the legislative bodies, uh, this has to be addressed because this is government by fiat yes. if there is no time for comment. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, quick comment on that that I want to yield to my fellow uh, excellent panelists. Um, you know, John Adams said that the brilliance of this country is that we're a country of laws, not a country of men. And what you're describing is this turn to be from a country of laws into a country of men, where the bureaucrat rides in one day and says, I am the law today. And it's even gotten worse than that, maybe not at the FDA, uh, but in places like the, the financial sector, where you pass Dodd-Frank, uh, 
we obviate, we as a Congress obviate our, our duty for lawmaking and give it to unelected, unaccountable people. In the Dodd-Frank case, 400 regulations that these bureaucrats were supposed to propose two years after Dodd-Frank, they were at Rule 71 or so. So now we're moving from, I am the law today, I am the bureaucrat, to I am the bureaucrat, we don't know what the law is. And that's a, at that point, you've, you have a breakdown in society. <laughs> I mean, is that, is, is that critical? Um, what I propose that I think we should get back to is this idea of formal rulemaking. You know, right now, whether, no matter how many days uh, you know, we have for comment, we're under a, a, a schematic of informal rulemaking. And we've operated like this for decades. Formal rulemaking, and I believe Heritage talks about this in one, in one of your papers, would, would have us go back to where there'd actually be hearings about a proposed rule from the bureaucracy. And you take evidence on every side, and then the result of that case might go back to Congress for an up or down vote. Slow this down, much more due process, uh, much more responsibility put back on us to do the lawmaking. If we had the, pol the political will and the guts to do what I just said, and I hope we can get there, that would give you the certainty I think you were looking for. Do we have a couple more questions and then we'll continue with the rest of the panel? Yes, Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Enson with IRET. Harmonization is another word for competition among regulators, uh, putting some pressure on them to get themselves in gear. Uh, and it's a great first step in the medical devices, but FDA is also a uh, been shown to be very slow in approving new drugs and in approving new classes of drugs and new methods of evaluating drugs that may be uh, uh, individual specific now that we have so much more technology and, and uh, things related to the DNA of the tumors and so forth. Is there any way of getting more harmonization in other areas and speeding up the FDA approval process and reducing the costs of it? You know, we have to watch this bill. Um, Kathy McMorris Rogers, HR, and again, I'll give you the, the, the bill number, uh, 3230. Because this is going to be the test case, sir. And if we can get harmonization in terms of our regulations, and I do believe that bill applies to not only medical devices, but also pharmaceutical applications as well. Uh, the, you know, then the next step is to, to uh, continue broadening that. But this is, this is the test bill, so support it in, every, in all its forms and every way, all the way down the line. Great. Well, to give the congressman some time to also hear the great other panelists we have, I think we'll, we'll shift over now. Um, next, we'll hear from Dr. William Hansen. He is the Chief Medical Information Officer and Vice President for the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Dr. Hansen recently published two books on innovation, uh, The Edge of Medicine, The Technology That Will Change Our Lives, and, and Smart Medicine, How Changing Role of Doctors Will Revolutionize Healthcare, and I, which I will note is in the back, because I did, I did see it, so if you'd like to take a look at it. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Hansen. Thanks, Nina, and uh, thanks for the invitation from Jamie and the Gillen Institute. Thought I'd step back for a second um, to perhaps the ridiculous and then move on to the more specific and sublime um, in the industry. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist and a cardiac, uh, a cardiac anesthesiologist and intensivist. I've grown up in a very high tech, uh, innovation rich environment, and um, innovation thrives in that area, and I thought it'd be worthwhile just looking at this from an ecosystem standpoint, because I think about new ecosystems as being opportunities for innovation, and technologies in some senses represent new ecosystems, and an example of that might be a new robotic surgical device or an ophthalmoscope back 100 years ago. The ophthalmoscope opened up a whole new area of investigation for uh, what turned out to be a new discipline. But I'm going to tee up this by talking a little bit about um, uh, the topic that will be elaborated on by Dr. Sweetman and Dr. Niederhuber in a second and then come back to where we're going here by talking about these three animals. Um, so how many people here think that this animal here is most closely related to that animal? 
Hands? And how many think it's most closely related to this animal? So this is obviously a hippo and a pig and a hippo and a whale. Well, for the longest time, uh, people that classify animals thought that these two animals were very closely related. And it was only when we got uh, better information about DNA that we realized that the hippo and the whale are very closely related. And you have to go a long way in the phylogenetic tree to get to the pig, despite the fact that pigs and hippos are short, have short legs, they're heavy bodied, their jaws are very similar, and um, they're ugly. <laughs> Well, how does that have anything to do with medicine? We're in the midst of understanding medicine in some very new ways that's gonna change the way that we do business and really open up a whole new opportunity for one form of innovation. So here is what might have been called the International, international Classification of Diseases circa uh, 1800. So this was the old medical phy phy phylogeny, and you have diseases here like black pox, bloody flux, brain fever. And this is what a learned professor of medicine, uh, as I'm described by some on occasional days, would talk about on rounds as if those were the diseases that you were taking care of. And we now know that those diseases come from, in the case of meningitis, for example, very specific bacterial organisms. So we've reclassified those diseases and there's you know, now new ways of treating those diseases specifically on a bacterial by bacterial basis. This is the current day medical phylogeny, which is uh, International Classification of Disease version nine. And some of you may be aware that we're about to embark on ICD-10. CMS pushed the deadline back about a year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which gives us some breathing room. There's a whole lot of activity going on with new uh, requirements. Um, Representative Elmers mentioned the uh, meaningful use requirements. That's what I live and breathe as a chief medical information officer. There's a lot of stuff going down that uh, uh, is changing what we do and, and the pace of change. But all of these things are gonna allow us new opportunities for innovation. So my last slide is this one, and then I'll talk about some specifics. The future is now, we're now at a point where we're taking information from the bench genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and we'll hear more from a couple of speakers following me about uh, what's being done with that, and computerized clinical data and marrying that up. I have a loom here. It's being woven together on an ad hoc basis to create new information. There will be new diseases and new treatments. And I think I have one last slide here that uh, goes to one that Dr. Sweetman will elaborate on his, his, his talk. This came out a couple of weeks ago in, uh, I guess, the LA Times. Breast cancer classification promises better therapies. Breast cancer of a certain type was reclassified as being 10 breast cancers, each of which might have different molecular targets. Huge new opportunity for treatments on a very specific, uh, classification by classica classification species, where you have new molecular targets and you can be very precise as opposed to applying a hammer to all of those breast cancers uh, that's nonspecific, which is what we do currently. And again, you'll hear more from this from other speakers. So we're in a new world where we have computerized information about our patients and we have bench information about their genome, and that's a huge new ecosystem where there are a lot of uh, uh, wonderful things are likely to happen provided the right um, uh, fertilizer, soil, governmental regulations, uh, support are in place. So we heard yesterday about CMS um, granted 125, I believe, um, uh, applications or funded uh, the first wave of applications for CMS innovation grants. There's a lot of microscopic innovation going on in, in, in the industry, and just to run through some of them, um, one big area that we're gonna need to do is to marry up the genomic data with clinical data. These are huge data sets. They're gonna require collaborations between pharma and academics, uh, between academic institutions and other academic institutions, and the vehicle for doing that is gonna be things like the cloud, which um, Mr. O'Leary will speak about in his, his talk. Critical, 
highway for the movement of this information, and big data is the computing power to make those associations work. Um, in fact, the, uh, the uh, uh, NIH just put out a uh, request for proposals for a big data uh, grant. Um, with clinical data alone, we're getting a lot of information from the electronic medical records that have been supported by meaningful use requirements, which will allow us to do predictive analytics. So what is that? that we hear about it in Netflix, we hear about it in Amazon, we hear about it in mortgage fraud, I mean, credit card fraud, mortgage analysis. This is having big, discrete data sets that we can say this pattern of data is associated with this behavior. So if someone uses a credit card in Cairo, I just happened to come back from there just before this latest outbreak, uh, the credit card company is going to say, if you're typically operating in the U.S., maybe there's a problem there and flag it. We can do the same thing with patient data and say, this pattern of data is, um, is uh, representative of someone who's likely to be readmitted. And I've flagged that patient before they're discharged and potentially intervene appropriately. Um, we're going to learn about patients uh, buying and developing their own apps. And I happened, this was not a prop, but somebody told me about this the other day. I found myself, like a lot of you, probably saying, you know, I'm sitting at my desk way too often, for too long. I used to be an anesthesiologist walking around a whole lot, and I'm too sedentary. So someone said there's this new device called a Fitbit, which is this little thing like a money clip, which you stick in your pocket. It tells you during the course of the day how much you've walked, how many stairs you've climbed, how far you've gone. You can then create a data set. Patients are creating data sets when they bike, when they exercise, and they're going to be bringing that to us in the clinical world and saying, here's my data. I want you to integrate that with my medical data. Big opportunity for innovation, a lot of innovation happening already, a lot of stu fun stuff going on there, because that's wellness. And again, uh, Mr. Quinn talked about wellness. Uh, wellness is very critical to healthcare going forward. Mobile, as a part of the Fitbit thing I just mentioned, a lot of innovation going on with mobile apps sponsored by the government. Um, there is a lot of computing power in your phone. You can attach a lot of devices to your phone. The phones can talk to the cloud. You're going to be walking around with a little healthcare advisor on your hip in the very near future that can tell you in real time what's going on. And finally, I just want to mention this because this is sort of something that I, you know, I think is very cutting edge that uh, is coming into. Wharton, the Leonard Davis Institute, which is a, a, a part of my institution, Penn, where we're using social tools. So the patient with obesity may go out with uh, advice to weigh themselves on a frequent basis or congestive heart failure to do these things. And if they fail to do them, the historic approach would be they come in a month later and say, I didn't keep track of it or my log is out of date. Now we can, in real time, say that patient didn't register their weight this day, and then go to a social support network. It might be family members, it might be neighbors, to have them uh, involve themselves with supporting the patient in um, taking care of themselves. And this is being done in the military, as I'm sure you know, uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder, and a number of ways in which support networks can help in care going forward, enabled by IT investments. So I'll wrap up here and say that uh, there is a lot of innovative ferment going on in my institution. I have residents, medical students, um, companies coming into my office more or less on a daily basis with bright new ideas that require uh, some verification, some funding, but um, there's a lot of innovative ferment going on right now. It, it needs the right sunlight, soil, and water. Thank you. continue on with our, with our final speaker, who is uh, William O'Leary, the Executive Director of Policy for Health and Human Services at Microsoft. Mr. O'Leary is the author of Microsoft's Connected Health and Human Services Business and Architecture Vision, which is a roadmap to develop consumer-centered services across governments and service providers. Please join me in welcoming Mr. O'Leary. Am I going backwards on this? Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you. It's great to be here with Galen. Um, I want to basically, I want to make some comments in the context of this larger health policy environment and the role technology as does play, can play. Um, but I want to start with just a, a couple comments about the environment we're in. Um, regardless of the outcome of the Supreme Court decision at the end of June or in June, we are, we are going to be in an environment where we're talking still about prohibitive cost, which I'll get into more in a moment, um, and the impact of the cost of health as it relates to competition in business, consumer access, and frankly, um, the impact it has on state and local governments. So we have a cost question. In addition to that, um, we're, going to, we're in an environment where we have a primary care shortage. So oftentimes we've been talking about access in the context of insurance coverage, uh, but the dominant theme over uh, hanging the, the country really, and we see this particularly in rural areas, but urban as well, is a um, shortage and a pending further shortage of primary care access. In other words, the workforce. Um, in addition to that, we have an environment, I, I was thinking of the, the Congressman's comments about what his Secretary of State, when he was um, working uh, to connect the citizens through self-service application, technology applications. In healthcare, up until recently, um, we've had the consumers as a pretty much non-active participant in a competitive marketplace. So, in effect, we, we've got some pretty significant barriers in terms of the cost question in terms of the workforce question, and in terms of the need for the consumer to become actively engaged. Um, when you think of those, um, um, we, we actually have an environment that uh, it, it, those crises are actually creating a number of different opportunities. And those opportunities um, are focusing on extending the workforce. They're focused on reducing cost, measuring outcomes, they're focused on um, competition in new business models. And in that regard, technology can be an enabler. Um, and I'll get to this more in a moment. And it's a particularly an enabler in an environment, sometimes on the low technology themes here, on the work that you know, extends back to what uh, Bill Gates and others did in the, in, when we first start with the PC, right up to what we're seeing Apple ourselves at Microsoft and others doing on, on, on uh, connectivity and devices. If you went back, um, geez, even a decade ago, uh, you would have probably found on high-risk, low-income populations, maybe 30 or 40 percent uh, had access and utilized cell phones. Today you have about 95 percent, 90 percent. That changes potential business models and it impacts the uh, overlapping interests of multiple stakeholders, whether that's pharma, physicians, community care coordinators, because you can now text people to remind them to take their medications. So we're seeing a lot of different types of developments on the technology and the business side, but I would argue that the, the focus, the primary focus on this is being driven by cost, by cost of healthcare in the country and the threat that that persists outside of the current policy debate, the current costs are associated with health are, health are a problem. This slide actually, I'll just point a couple things out on it. Um, if you look at it on, as a national, from a national perspective, that the Medicaid and Medicare costs rising as a part of the budget, um, very importantly, and you see, that, you see pretty much, well I would say it isn't so much a red state, blue state perspective on the, on the next point. Most of the governors and the counties and many, most, the, the mayors as well, they are, they are concerned about the fact that the rising costs of Medicaid as a part of the state budget, I'll just Medicaid as a point, are actually driving down their ability to invest in education, in transportation, and in local aid. So you've got a tension there. You've got a tension on the rising cost of the overall uh, federal budget as well. And the competition for businesses like Microsoft or, or um, Walmart or um, all of the other partners that we work with um, in, in companies in the U.S., it is staggering to them that you're talking about nearly 18 percent of the GDP is, 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 uh, is in healthcare right now in the U.S., where you're talking about 8.5 percent in Europe and you're talking about 4.5 percent in China. 
So when you look at that context and, the, and, and when, you, when you look at CEOs of companies and where they rank health care costs as a priority and a concern, that, that, that adds more of a context in terms of how and where they locate their workforce um, and why the cost of health care is such a major issue. And then finally, on the workers, same situation. They're spending 47 percent more on health care in recent years. Wage increases at about 18 percent. So everything else aside, the cost of health is not sustainable in the United States. These are some of the themes that I just mentioned. I, I would, and I, we've got a marketplace where we're talking about rising costs. We've got an interesting convergence of public sector and commercial financing, a demand for improved outcomes because we need them cheaper, technology advancements, which I'll get to, consumer involvement as a need, a necessity, um, care coordination strategies as new business models, and then security and privacy concerns, um, dominant in the U.S., and will become even more dominant as we look at people using uh, Windows devices or iPhones or other devices to share health information. So ensuring that those technologies that are ubiquitous are able to uh, deal with the, the security and privacy concerns. Um, so, I mean, we, we've been convening groups around the country, commercial, heavy business. I'll, I'll speak more about this in a moment. Um, health entities, other technology companies, consumers, not-for-profits. And these are the themes that, that arise in that discussion when you talk about competition, business, um, government, transformed healthcare system to improve health. So rather than this question of how do we, which has really been the dominant policy themes in healthcare of how do we um, uh, reduce cost, measure outcomes, and improve access, um, we would basically posit that you have to improve, uh, uh, measure and improve outcomes, improve care, uh, improve access. But the cost question isn't the fourth pillar. The cost, cost question should be under all of those. You have to, you, we have to find strategies to do all of them at less cost. And the means by which you're going to do that is collaboration across businesses, new business models, collaboration between business and government, and leveraging technology advancement and driving involvement of the consumer. When we look at technologies, um, uh, and I'm not going to go deep on this for time, but I'll just, I just want to give, uh, give a bit of a span of the universe of some of the technology themes here. Um, technologies that can scale access and, and enable delivery system innovation. So think about this. You've got a primary care shortage and too much cost. Um, what are we seeing happen on the new business models? Well, Walmart talks about what they're doing. I mean, you're talking about food deserts. You're talking about leveraging existing capital investments. And uh, by the way, uh, stores in, that are proximate to incredible percentages of the population in the United States, which is efficient, leveraging the technology that, they, that they're utilizing for other parts of their business, and bringing the consumer in and engaging the consumer. We're seeing similar models on, on, in the health industry itself, uh, we did a forum in, in San Diego and with, with the work that Kaiser's doing, with the work that um, Walmart uh, uh, and Governor Brandstad are doing um, on the wellness side, uh, Johnson & Johnson. So what we're starting to see is businesses in the business of healthcare, businesses that aren't in the business of healthcare, focusing heavily on the cost of health and thinking about innovation. So you're seeing minute clinics in CVS where you extend from pharma out into the community. Wal Walgreens is doing similar work. In each of those instances, technology is a significant part of that discussion. And, and sometimes it's low tech. Sometimes, as I said, it's what's the highest, where would you have an overlap of interest if you think about this between, um, and I'll give you groups that don't often deal together. Think of um, the pharma industry, CMS, Medicaid, state, and community care providers. Well, the, one of the high, highest cost populations are the behavioral health dual diagnosis Medicaid population. Leveraging texting or other sh low, low, low uh, cost technologies for medication adherence to remind people to take medications can dramatically reduce cost on that end. Um, we're also seeing technologies that get and keep consumers engaged in health care. Excuse me. Good to see you, Congress. 
technologies that get and keep consumers engaged in their health care and proactively manage health risk and navigate the delivery system. This is, I would argue, I, I was involved in a process about eight years ago where for two years I co-chaired a task force on health quality access um, with, it was a national group focused within a state. The lack of consumer involvement was the biggest concern. Consumers actually are getting pretty involved. So what you're talking about is the congressman did about um, self-service. There's multiple ways on, that consumers are starting to get into the game on the, on the, on, on the health care decision-making, navigating access. And part of that is because they're digital natives. So the people who are below the age of 35, 40, they are very familiar with technology. And when you take another t five or 10 years from now, even right now, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, they are dependent and are holding business and healthcare accountable to, to deliver the technology access. Improvement on population health through healthy communities, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Integrating government and private sector efforts to use technology to connect people and systems to rationalize spending. I'll just make a point on this, I, I make it a lot. And this is on the macro side of federal government spending. We, we have the federal government funding large technology systems in each state for Medicaid, for children and family services. I mean, you go a host of agencies. You've got child care services, public health services. I was formerly a secretary of health and human services for, a few, for two governors in a state. The fact of the matter is, when you look at those services, 74% of the population are being served by multiple services. Each of those agencies are funded with mega legacy technology systems that often and generally don't connect with each other. So the idea of leveraging technology to share information across systems, I mean, you could look at a state like New York that'll spend $300 million on a Medicaid system and $200 million on a, another one of those systems, but historically, the same consumer could be involved in all of those agencies and no agency could easily tell what that consumer was involved in. There's no logic in that. Technology a decade ago took us beyond that. So when we think of this from, again, uh, the prism I would put on this is how do you en en enhance outcomes, access, measure information, as was mentioned earlier, for instance, business intelligence and fraud and abuse. How do you, how do you leverage that? How do you do that at better cost? starting from the consumer all the way up to the largest enterprise. Um, and then investing in cloud shared services and emerging technologies. And again, that, the, the, the example I gave, an example that was given earlier is, is a good one in that, which goes to uh, things like business in, in intelligence or pr uh, predictive um, analytics, where you now can pretty readily leverage disparate, piece, uh, uh, disparate information and pretty accurately start to hone in on things like fraud and abuse, or risk factors in social services, or um, risk factors in delivery of health care, and how, how to, where you're seeing population health issues, and how to modify your approach and target your approaches. When I was secretary, for instance, in, in, in one of the things we did was, when I mentioned those multiple agencies, we, I, we created a simple common client index that would give us a view towards the people we served across the 15 agencies. And we found that 74% of the population, this was a $12 billion enterprise, basically, across all these agencies. 74% of the populations of the highest risk systems were involved, were lived in only 24 zip codes. That, just that, <laughs> that, that analysis allows you to rethink how you're spending money, how you're engaging business and competition. Okay. Um, I want, to, I, want to, I, want, I want to give a, I, I, want to, I want to make the point to some of how we at Microsoft, in addition to the development of those technologies and our work in healthcare, but from the, whether it's from the, the personal health record to the analytics to the consumer devices, how we're working in building technologies, we're investing billion, 50 billion plus a year in research on in, in Redmond. But we're also very focused on, as I started with, on the models that we're seeing arise competitively in changing business environment in healthcare. We've been, um, in, in, on that we're focusing a lot on the wellness question because if you think about it, regardless of a lot of the other policy, right, discussions, you're looking at five chronic diseases, um, uh, including heart disease, stroke, respiratory illness, um, uh, diabetes, right? If you take those four, right, they are responsible for about, uh, for a major, 50 percent of the fatalities in the country and a majority of the health care spending. And the 
they can be, um, they are largely impacted by um, uh, lack of exercise, poor diets, and smoking. And so where you're seeing great anxiety in business, I mean, you look at a lot of the big Fortune 500 companies, they're putting a lot of attention on that question right now because the, the health of their workers is a, is a part of their productivity. Similarly, when you're looking at communities around the country and kids in school, you get these questions of, um, or elder populations, how do we drive the cost down and improve the care in that regard? Well, we're seeing a lot of innovation on the business models arising at the intersect of business and public health, or business and health. And we're putting a spotlight on that, and we're looking at how technology impl impl implicates that. But in, 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 in this last year and this next year, what we've been doing is going around the country and convening forums co-hosted by ourselves, by business. So for instance, we were in Chicago and San Diego with the Chambers of Commerce, with the public health officials, um, with, with companies indigenous to the communities. So in Chicago, we were with Walgreens. In San Diego, we were with Kaiser and others. Um, and we're co-hosting a forum here in DC in a number of weeks with those groups and a number of other um, national business leaders, health leaders, um, not-for-profits, focusing on financing of models. What, what is the, because this idea of competition is interesting at the intersect of business and not-for-profits, for instance. What's the role of the venture capitalists on financing new models for care coordination? Um, how are we seeing the Walgreens and the Johnson and Johnsons and others modify their business models to deal with these wellness questions? Um, because we think that's the future roadmap of technology, but ultimately, if you start to cut into that cost curve as it relates to those chronic diseases, then regardless of the rest of the noise around us, you start to bring the cost down, expand the access, and improve the outcomes. Thank you. Well, I think one of the, in before we're starting with questions, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. But what crystallized for me in hearing both of you is this idea that with technology, you can actually see a person kind of as a whole, rather than looking at people in, in a certain kind of slice, which I think is really um, kind of trailblazing in that way, whether it's on the medical side or actually how we see them in a variety of other areas. Uh, do we have a question for, for any of our well, panelists? Maybe. Yeah, maybe you'd like to you comment. You all here, okay. Dr. Andrabi mentioned this as well, this idea of white space. You know, you think about a patient who comes into your office, you have that very, very discreet point of dark space of information, and then they're in white space for weeks, months, where you have no information. And the opportunity to use some of these technologies, mobile devices, devices in the home, to acquire information that would tell you about what actually is happening on a day-to-day -day basis about the things that you care about is, is critical, and, and that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could as well. I, I think e examples of some of where you're going to see this m develop more and more are, um, if, you, if you think, I give two ends of the age spectrum. You take children and then you take elderly. And I'll start with the elderly. The, the, the greatest percentage of the cost on the, we'll go to Medicaid again, their, their, their greatest cost is long-term care, okay? And if we think of um, where technology is going in that regard, we're starting to see development, and this is within our company and others, where you would take, you would, you would take gaming devices like uh, what Microsoft has, Xbox Connect, okay? But you're seeing the development in, in the industry on gaming devices and thinking about the applicability of those in healthcare. Mm. So for instance, uh, somebody's at home, you want to reduce the amount of time that they're having to um, spend in rehab after a, uh, um, an orthopedic problem, whether it's a hip fracture or something else. Um, the, the key is you want to reduce time away from the, uh, their family or, their, or their, the least um, um, in a more home-like environment, right? Well, you, so we're seeing rapid development of, and you will see more of this, applications and communication directly with, with uh, primary care teams at home to do rehab assisted with a, whether it's a connect device on television, with a um, application that is a rehab application. Um, similarly with children, we're seeing Boys Club and Girls Clubs of America um, also working with gaming devices on activity and, and tying that, that to um, uh, pedometers and being able to measure the impact of calorie redu reduction um, 
and have that upload into your um, um, personal health record for children and adults. So you're starting to see the ubiquity of technology surrounding the population, but also being able to focus on how do we care for them more at their home or in community settings. Any questions? Well, um, one, one device I, I, I have to mention is smart slippers. Hmm. So how much is grandma walking and how steadily? I actually have a, a follow-up question based on what do you see, um, Dr. Hansen, in the medical schools? Are they integrating more technology as part of the uh, in, as yeah, part you know, of that's practice? A, that's a totally fascinating question. So I have probably on a monthly basis a medical student come into my office and say, I got this great idea. I want to do a, uh, I, I want to build a mobile device. I want to build a web device. I want to do something with IT. They're coming to me because I'm an IT person. A lot of very smart guys, gals thinking about that, and there is no medical school curriculum that I'm aware of uh, anywhere in the country that's really focused on IT-enabled innovation, hmm. which I think is a big dearth. Now, there are a lot of innovative medical curriculums. Simulation, huge. Team building, huge part of medical curriculum that's new. A lot of stuff going on, but there's a big <laughs> void there, and, and I think we're trying to retool that, but um, it's a gap. Mm, interesting. Well, now we've got a lot of questions that have popped up. Uh, if you can wait till you get the microphone so others um, can hear. Can you raise your hands again so we don't miss everyone? Oh, right here, and then one more in the front, and uh, then in the back. Aren't uh, Medicare and Medicaid the biggest most inhibiting legacy systems uh, that we're really uh, confronted with and overcoming and getting innovation mm -hmm. on track and implemented? But, well, there, there certainly have been, and on the one, and the one hand, CMS has played a pretty, uh, 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 if you were to compare them to the federal agencies on the technology side, they have adopted an architecture, technology architecture that would break that down and start to share information across systems. On the other hand, it's like moving a, a ship. Um, the, it, it, they are such a dominant amount of the payment of healthcare in the country. And you know, you, you start to look at the data that they have access to on their population. You know, we often talk about it as it relates to um, issues surrounding health reform, but What's as important, if you were a governor, would be, how do I connect the dots between my Medicaid system, my child welfare system, and my um, uh, child care system, and my social services system? Because the cost, if you're talking about the same person being involved in all four of those agencies, and the majority of them being in very discrete zip codes in the state, the inability to, to measure or look at that data is just enormous. And I, and I think you're going to see a lot of focus on that question in the next number of years. Um, and I think you're going to find uh, the, the, the models that you're seeing in the business environment are just such, so much more nimble in the healthcare delivery world than the large uh, uh, bureaucracy is able to adapt to. But I think you're going to see a lot of pressure to break that down. And I'm sure, too, with, the, with cost, everything yeah. is now on the yeah. table. Uh, yeah. Bob Helms with AEI. Uh, yeah, Bob Helms, AEI. It's a similar question, but I want to uh, put it on a different level. Uh, I think most of us would agree that our lives are sort of dominated now by emails from various things. I mean, whether it's managing my tennis team or dealing with my colleagues at AEI, it's all done through emails and has been for years. Yet I don't think I've ever had an email from my physician. And when you think about it, I think it goes back to Medicare and Medicaid fee-for-service dominated system. Uh, he has no incentive to do this. As a matter of fact, he's got a lot of disincentives to get involved in communicating with me. But I can think of lots of medical questions and so on that we could settle in five minutes if we could exchange emails. But payment policy, he's got to have me come into the office before he gets paid. So uh, my question is to Mr. Leary, so uh, it, do you see how do you get around this problem? Do you see any changes? Uh, um, what will it take uh, to really change this? I think on the payment, I mean, so you're, I totally agree with you in terms of the payment structure is, can be a disincentive. 
Um, I do think we're starting to see some models arise from businesses that are they, that are raising the flag on this question and actually will be implementing pilots to just show this. So for instance, I, the point I raised earlier, if you really take a look at the workforce shortage, then the absolute necessity would be that you scale primary care coordination leveraging technology because you don't, so you could have, it, it's not really different from the medical home themes that have existed over the years, but the point there being, um, and we're seeing this in some of the pharmacies in, in, in what pharma is starting to think of as a partner with different groups, but this question again of very simply medication adherence. Um, we, we have access to populations who actually are holding devices that you can communicate with. And there's a financial and a health outcome incentive if exercised, but there's an incentive um, to communicate with them. Um, so you're starting to see a lot around those um, in that regard. I think you're gonna see more. I think you're gonna see it from the, um, from the Walmarts. You're already seeing it, I think, as I mentioned. I mean, people get, you, you get notification from your pharmacy see now a lot faster than you used to by phone or text mm -hmm. in a lot of parts of the country saying, by the way, your, your medication could be refilled, right? In community, not, in, in, in federally qualified health centers in the country, you are seeing increasing communication directly to consumers who are high risk saying, and I'll go again to medication adherence. Did you take your med? Make sure you take your med. Because the cost of not doing it is just dramatic in terms of, they're, them in, in, in ending up back in, in, um, in hospitals or um, different um, units. So I think what we're seeing is the technology exists, business models are emerging um, in health industries, whether it's pharma or others. Businesses themselves are, in, in large businesses focusing on wellness, they are really starting to get all over this question of we've got to improve outcomes, we're not waiting. We're going to start communicating directly with our, our consumers. So you have a company like ours that is setting up um, primary care, not just call-ins, but primary care consultation on m m more and more types of information to help with it relates to wellness. I think hopefully that as you see more and more of a convergence and emergence of that, that'll just dominate the discussion on the payment reform because there's no logic in not paying for prevention or wellness options that you can absolutely measure and prove, you know? And I, so I think you're gonna see that develop, that occurring. Yeah, let me elaborate on that very quickly. So we, we have at the health system uh, a portal, patient portal. We're pushing lab results out automatically with some very limited exceptions, pushing radiology results out automatically and providing a conduit for communication between a patient and the provider. Some of the providers uh, are making good use of that. Others, frankly, aren't. So, um, and you know, for the reasons you mentioned, there's no reimbursement for it necessarily, but in the right model, patient uh, center medical home is a, is a model in which these sorts of things are guaranteed to a certain degree. I think there will be more of that. I don't think you're ever gonna see, uh, you know, a, a two-way text dialogue between your doctor and every patient going on. It's just not appropriate for well, a variety of reasons. Well, thank you all. I think we're up on our time. Let's please thank our panelists. Thank you. We're going to move right to the next panel, so just hold still. Thank you very much, Jay. Nina. Thank you very much to our panel. We are going to move to our keynote speaker, and I need to do a little bit of switching here, so excuse me one second. No, I don't want to look. I need um, PowerPoint. Open. You're all watching me while I'm get to the Drive, hmm, local disk. See if it can't find that. Do this again. There we go. Yeah, 
Nanopro, there we go. Okay, Galen Institute, there we go. I know how to do this. This, this, uh, here we go. Oh no, press escape key to open the document. There we go. And let's get you to the screen. I don't need that. Help enable external content for this session. Nope. There we go. All right. Thank you all for the momentary interruption with technology. We are delighted to have as our morning keynote speaker, speaker Dr. John Nieberhuber, who is the currently and recently joined Innova Health Systems as Executive Vice President and CEO of Innova's Translational Medicine Institute. He served for the previous five years as the director of the National Cancer Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health from 2006 to 2010. And he is, we're just delighted to have him here with us today. He's truly a visionary leader in oncology. He, um, for example, began the Cancer Genome Atlas, an effort to comprehensively identify genomic changes in all cancer types and subtypes. He has been recognized by his peers elected as president and vice president both of the Society for Surgical Oncology and president of the Association of the American Cancer Institutes. He is, um, more about his biography is in your programs and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Nieberhuber. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for the uh, very uh, kind invitation to be here this morning. You've been much too serious this morning, <laughs> much too serious. So I'm going to try to change, uh, change the tenor just a little bit uh, and project you uh, uh, with a little fantasy, perhaps. I'll apologize for that, uh, in, uh, a bit into uh, the future. And <clears throat> I'm going to make a very bold prediction. Um, if there were people in their 20s and 30s in the audience, I see maybe a couple, uh, they, would, they wouldn't have any problem with this statement at all. They would buy into it immediately. Some of us, a little bit on the older side of the uh, equation, perhaps uh, get a little nervous uh, when I make this statement. But I will predict that every one of you in the room will have uh, your whole genome and how that genome functions. We call that the epigenetics or the genomics of your genome, how the genes are expressed or regulated. That you'll have all that data sometime within the next decade as part of your uh, medical record. And if you think about it, that data, that information integrated into your health record is really how in the future we will identify risk uh, we will identify how to manage those risks of a disease, chronic disease especially. Uh, and even uh, in very, very early stages of disease, make uh, diagnoses that we can't make right now uh, until they're much further down the road of development. And of course, um, that's how we, in, on the science side of the equation, will identify new targets and new interventions improve the efficacy of those interventions. We talk a lot about, and you read in the newspapers, um, <clears throat> the great scientific journals, uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, about uh, what personalized medicine really is. And I just wanted to set the stage to remind you that it really is um, your personal health care uh, but driven by the knowledge, the powerful knowledge of what your genome is. And what, in other words, what you've inherited in terms of your genetic information that drives the, the functions of the cells and tissues of your body and the risks you have for disease of the future. <clears throat> it's how um, it, the processing, the integration of this information uh, will be integrated and, and usable to impact on your health care. Um, <clears throat> I thought, uh, looking out at the audience, that maybe you needed just a bit of a refresher course 
uh, back to your uh, high school uh, AP biology and to your college uh, biology course. Uh, and uh, so stop for a minute, think back a few years, just a few years, I realize, to those courses. And remember that uh, DNA, the nucleus of your cell, the code of information uh, of life, if you will, that that DNA is composed of four bases, as you see here on the slide. And it's that sequence, that configuration of those bases on the chromosomes uh, within your cells that code for what we call our genes. And that the genes are responsible for then making a copy of themselves, uh, the messenger RNA. Do you remember that now? I see a few eyes lighting up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that from days past, and it's the gene codes for a protein concept. And it's the proteins, remember from biology, that are the building blocks of our cells, our tissues and our organs and our body. It's the proteins that communicate the messages within the cell, so how the cell functions, and between the cells that make up the tissues of the body. So now you're beginning, I hope, to recall back the importance of these bases, T, C, G, and A, and the opportunity for those to drive healthcare of the future. Let me give you a couple of examples real quick. <clears throat> this is a family, and this has been, uh, the family has published this, so we're not violating any HIPAA regulations here. Um, <clears throat> this has been published, and this is a family, you can see father in the background, and father was a chief information officer at a company called Life Technologies. And he had uh, fraternal twin children, Noah and Alexa. And all through their very early years of development, there was something about those two kids that just wasn't quite right. Uh, they had a lot of muscular issues, coordination issues, and some other things to make the long story short. Um, but it wasn't until age six that the pediatricians that had been seeing them over the years recognized that what they had <clears throat> was what's called dopa responsive dystonia. And literally, think about that as a connection of the nerve to the muscle. And it's that connection of interface uh, where there's a chemical reaction that occurs to make that uh, muscle respond. Um, <clears throat> so they were placed on a, a, a very available medication and that helped their symptoms quite a bit. But at age 13, Alexa, the daughter, began to have a lot more difficulty. And most of those difficulties were around respiratory, around breathing, coughing, pneumon repeated pneumonias. She had to drop out of uh, first her physical activity, soccer, which she loved. Uh, she then uh, had difficulty actually attending school. The father pushed because he was connected with life technologies, connected with the technology behind getting one's whole genome sequence accomplished. He put forward a, a, a pitch to his company. He lobbied his company to help. Uh, he thought that if they could just generate this whole genome sequence of these two kids, their family, they might find the answer to what was going on with Alexa and Noah. And lo and behold, that was accomplished. Um, at a significant expense, I might add, several years ago, much cheaper today, and we'll talk about that down the road. And he found, or they found, in analyzing that data, that there was another gene involved uh, with a mutation that affected how that enzyme that the gene coded for actually functioned. And, <clears throat> and that could be an explanation because it was involved <clears throat> and the synthesis of one of the neurotransmitters of dopamine and serotonin, those chemicals at the nerve muscle inter intersection. A simple uh, introduction of another medication into the regimen 5-hydroxytryptophan, and you can see a very happy family, and I can report that Alexa is back uh, performing soccer and all of the normal functions of uh, a young uh, teenager in high school. Here's a more complicated story, but it presents another aspect of how important this kind of information is. This is a, uh, a woman with a, uh, in her mid-50s with a 20-year history <clears throat> uh, that you can see on this uh, slide over to the right of the slide, of se severe pro progressive calcific disease of her, all of her peripheral vessels. 
uh, it wouldn't, because it was so diffuse, there wasn't something that could be done surgically to correct to get increased flow uh, through these uh, tortuous and calcified uh, vessels. She also had a lot of calcification depositions in the, in the joints, especially of her hands and her feet. And she was admitted to a program <clears throat> that I, I, I like very much because I was one uh, of the directors who co-chaired a committee and we lobbied for this program to be instituted at NIH in the clinical center. Uh, and so I'm pleased that she was admitted to this program uh, to uh, be studied. Uh, we, in the, the doctors in that clinic, uh, found uh, several other families, two other families with similar kinds of histories of vascular disease. And you can see that on the slide, how extensive that calcification is in those vessels and in the joints. Again, whole genome sequencing, the characteriz uh, characterization of those families' genomes, the parents and the siblings of several of the families, the three families, led to an area uh, that, de that could be studied intensely that showed there was a mutation in one specific gene, NT5E, that I show here on the slide. And lo and behold, this gene functions in a very critical pathway depicted by the artist on this slide. And what that that defect in that gene leads to is a, a buildup of calcium, a buildup of calcium. Calcium is metabolized in the normal fashion in these patients that have this defect, and it gets deposited where it's not supposed to be deposited, causing the vascular disease and the joint disease. Now, unlike Alexa and Noah, there isn't a drug at the moment that can be introduced to correct this defect in this particular pathway. But if you think about it, that's the kind of information that we need to take into the laboratory to develop the drug that can target that pathway and correct that. Won't help these patients with this progressive disease at this time, but it's a story that will help uh, identify this disease in others and prevent it. When I <coughs> left the NCI, and, the, uh, and decided what next to do with my life. I found a, a receptive environment at the Inova Health System. If I felt that, if I really believed in the power of, of genomic sequencing, genomic characterization, whole genome sequencing, and how that was going to transform medicine of the future, then this is something I would think we would want to start at the time of birth. We'd want to build that information right from the beginning of life. It really is information that defines one's life. It defines one's life. So we initiated a, a program at ANOVA that I'll talk about in just a minute, but let me make one additional comment. If you think about starting to get this information, define this information at the time of birth, you also have the opportunity to do what we call generational sequencing or generational genomic characterization, mother, father, siblings, offspring. Please accept, for you that are not scientists or physicians, that's tremendously empowering to the quality of the information, the accuracy of the information that we can uh, derive. We launched in uh, almost, uh, not quite a year ago, July of 2011, we launched a, a study at uh, the Inova Health System. The Inova Health System probably delivers more babies, uh, about 20,000 babies a year in the Inova Health System. I don't know if there's another health system around uh, that is quite uh, that prolific in terms of the number of babies. Even at Inova Fairfax Hospital, which is our academic uh, teaching hospital, uh, we have about 11,000 births per year and one of the largest neonatal intensive care units in, in uh, really in the country, but certainly in the region. And so we had access to help move this project forward, in my idea. Uh, <clears throat> and we started a project around preterm birth. Uh, those of you that are healthcare economists know this is a huge economic burden in our country. But um, <clears throat> we have uh, gotten well down the, the road with this project. We have uh, over 300 families, mothers, fathers, and baby 
uh, that have been a normal pregnancy, full-term uh, pregnancy, full-term delivery, uh, <clears throat> no uh, known problems. And we are about halfway through collecting the families that have had a preterm birth, no clinically known cause for that. We were very restrictive in our selection of those families. Um, <clears throat> we're about halfway through collecting uh, those families, and, and we anticipate that by uh, July or the end of the summer, we will have uh, those families uh, in tow. And we'll have well over 1,500, almost 2,000 whole genomes uh, and epigenetic information associated with those genomes from mother, father, offspring uh, to uh, uh, an analyze. Just uh, three weeks ago, we launched uh, a project that I'm extremely excited about. Uh, the Fairfax County Childhood Longitudinal Cohort. Uh, we have resources that we've accumulated to target uh, at ANOVA over the next two years, 2,500 families. Uh, <clears throat> we would like to work with other systems, and we're talking to other health systems uh, in, on the East Coast especially, to maybe increase that cohort to closer to 5,000 or 7,500 family cohort, uh, but again, that opportunity to characterize across generations, even in this case, we hope to have grandparents involved as well as siblings and the offspring. We are actually, interestingly, consenting the family in the first trimester of pregnancy so that we're able to follow uh, the mother through pregnancy. Uh, we're doing a lot of social history taking, nutritional, um, stress and other information taking uh, related to this project. So I'm excited about that. We've launched it only three weeks ago and already have three, I'm sorry, eight families that have signed up as of yesterday uh, to be part of this study. So we're moving along. This is a lot of information and you heard a little bit about that uh, uh, <clears throat> a bit ago. Bringing genomics and proteomics and metabolomics the, the science, if you will, the biology into and integrating with our phenotypic information of our health record creates a lot of information. Uh, I'm often asked when I talk about this, well, what is a terabyte? Um, <clears throat> what, what does that mean? How do I get my hands around it? How do I understand that? And I saw this in the Wall Street Journal, actually just recently on April 10th, and I thought this is a great explanation if you thought of an 11 ounce cup of coffee as being one gigabyte or a billion bytes of information, then a zettabyte, and you can see that on the graph as the projected amount of information that we will be dealing with in this age of data uh, in 2020 would be equivalent to the Great Wall of China. So that gives you a little bit of a perspective on the explosion of information in our world that we are uh, dealing with, and the healthcare industry will be part of that. Now, I'm also uh, <clears throat> asked often when I talk about, well, what is this sequencing? What, what, what do you do? Well, in most of the cases that we're talking about, we either isolate the DNA, the basic DNA from the cells, uh, either from tissue samples in the case of cancer, where we're looking at a specimen of lung cancer or colon cancer, for example, uh, or from white blood cells to look <coughs> at the DNA of, of an individual. Uh, that has to go through a, today uh, a lot of steps of processing to prepare it for actually generating this knowledge, this sequence. So I didn't want you to think it's just putting it in one end of a black box and out the other end comes the whole genome sequence. And I think you can begin to uh, see on this uh, a cartoon representation the complexity of this. So we've driven the cost of this from a billion dollars to do the first whole genome uh, back in 2002 to actually in our project, we're about $2,000 per whole genome. So you can see now that this is becoming medically affordable medically affordable to generate the data. 
We still have a big space or a big gap, if you will, to fill in the analysis part of this information. It's not simple information today to analyze. So that's where the expense continues, and we must drive those costs down, and I am confident that we will. And part of the work of the institute that I had is to actually work in that informatics space, if you will, the bioinformatics space, and, and making this information actually usable at the point of care. Um, you can see on this slide, we are bringing a lot of information together. We get information about allergies, we get information uh, about the, uh, certain disease parameters, uh, information from the, from the clinical lab about uh, blood chemistries, pathology. We bring it from all sources into uh, what we call our our electronic health record or our repository of information. We use that information to do a lot of different things, to manage the healthcare system, to manage the economics of the healthcare system that we operate, uh, <clears throat> but also to manage healthcare. And some of the comments that were made uh, earlier about bringing the patient together with the information are right on target. Uh, it will be truly transformative. What we're working on is to try to make this not a pass-through, simply a pass-through of information. We want to make this information smart, intelligent information. So we want to make the point of care absolutely as smart as we can. So in, in summary, I hope that I've left you with the concept that this will be part of your life of your family's life, that this is very powerful information, and the power of that information will grow logarithmically as we understand it and as we can relate it to actually the phenotype of the individual, the disease of the individual. It will be very powerful in giving the right dose to the right patient at the right time. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. We metabolize every drug differently. We're not all the same. And, <clears throat> and so pharmacogenomics, as we call it, will be a big part of this. And I've talked about the characterization at birth. In the end, this is about getting information, intelligent information, at the point of care. I do think that it's genomics, the power of genomics, and the power of information management that has the opportunity to bend this curve that we call the healthcare cost curve. So I hope I've left you with a couple of um, interesting thoughts today about the future of health, uh, the future of information management of a lot of data that will uh, be part of your healthcare, the genomics the, and the proteomics that will underpin uh, your risk of disease, uh, the disease itself, and your management of that disease. Thank you very much for your attention for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Niederhuber. It's really phenomenal when you think about the cost reduction from $1 billion to do the first genomic sequencing down to $2,000, if anything even remotely on that scale is possible in reducing cost of care, that's really I think if you look at the technologies that are right on the cusp or right around the corner of being introduced just on the side of being able to generate this data, we certainly will, within the next two, three years, be at less than $1,000. So generating the data is not the issue. The cost of analyzing that data and the time that it takes and the people that it takes, I have a group of about eight bioinformaticists and genomicists right now uh, that work on the data that we're generating around the preterm birth study. So you can get a sense that it's still 10 to 1 or 25 to 1 in terms of cost. But I'm very, very confident that we will understand how to drive that cost down, too. We have time for maybe one or two questions. We have a question over here. You can wait for the microphone, please. Tell us who you are. 
Um, my name is Peter Boetsma. I'm a health counselor in the Netherlands Embassy. And my question is, how do you view the regulatory process, the size of field studies, um, in relation to uh, the personalized medicine? Could you say something about that? The, the regulatory issues around uh, this kind of information and the use of this information in personalized medicine? Uh, the, approval the approval process. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think what, where you're directing your question at is if, if in, this, uh, in the generation of this information we would uh, identify specific uh, biomarker, we call it, or a specific uh, um, pattern of genetic abnormalities that would predict risk, that, that needs to be validated uh, in clinical studies, uh, and it needs to be a, uh, some approval process uh, for the validation of that. Uh, the FDA uh, is, I think, not certain uh, at this point how it's going to approach that, to be honest with you. I think it's like other areas of science. As you can tell, I've been around uh, a few number of uh, decades. It, the science will continue to drive this, and we as um, a society will figure out the regulatory uh, issues, the processes that we have to put in place to make it actually actionable and usable. Uh, it will take probably legislative action. It won't be, uh, it won't be simple. One can't lock all this information up in a lockbox. It's just not possible. So we're going to have to have legislation that protects the information and the use of the information. Time for maybe one more question. Well, to please join me in thanking Dr. Niederhofer for a fab fabulous presentation. We will we'll take a short break and we will return for our third panel on saving lives and creating jobs. So